previously on Grace to You. What is our gospel? What is the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, the gospel of salvation, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of the blessed God? What is it? What is it that he was eager to preach? What is it that he was obligated to preach? What is this gospel? We need to know what it is because it is that gospel which we proclaim. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If you really ever understand the glory of the gospel of salvation, you could never tamper with it. You see it in all its majesty, in all its beauty, in all its fullness. We don't need to give people some surfeited, some minimalist, some truncated understanding of the gospel. They need to be given the full glory of the gospel. So Paul, first of all, endured everything that he endured because he saw the glory of the gospel and he saw it from a personal viewpoint. Philippians 3, he went about to establish his own righteousness and then he realized it was all nothing. And he found the righteousness of God in Christ. When you've been truly regenerate, you understand that this is the message that must be preached, whatever the price. Secondly, he also embraced ministry as a mercy. He embraced ministry as a mercy. It may be an interesting concept, but look at verse 1. Since we have this ministry as we received mercy. There are some people who think they earn the right to preach the gospel, they earn the right to represent the gospel, they earn the right to proclaim the gospel. Let me tell you something. I'm not worthy, you're not worthy, none of us is worthy to proclaim this gospel. It is a mercy that we are allowed to do this. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 12, 1 Timothy 1, 12, who strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. You know why I'm in the ministry? Because God is merciful. I don't have a right to do this. I haven't earned this. Well, you've been to seminary. <laughs> that wouldn't do it. Oh, you have a communication gift. That wouldn't do it. The very fact that I can stand here and open the Word of God and proclaim the glorious gospel of Christ is a mercy to an unworthy sinner. And the elevation of this is so staggering. The privilege is so overwhelming. Here's the good news. It wasn't my strength that earned this right, and it isn't my weakness that forfeits it. It's a mercy. I don't deserve it. God gives it to me as a mercy. And in spite of my failures and my weakness, He continues to give me this mercy. And because I understand the ministry is a, is a mercy, I don't have a lot of expectations for what I'm able to accomplish. Can you get that thought? I hear about pastors who have burnout. What are you, what are you talking about, burnout? What do you mean? Burnout has nothing to do with hard work. I never saw a plumber that got burnout. I never saw a ditch digger that got burnout. It's not about effort. Burnout is a thing that happens to people who don't get their expectations met. I deserve better than this. You can't do this to me. Things aren't working out. I shouldn't be treated this way. Look, you don't ever want to be treated the way you should be treated. God doesn't even treat you the way you should be treated. 
People get burnout in ministry, they get warped, they get weary in well-doing because they have unrealistic expectations of what they think they deserve because they're qualified, because they're prepared, because they work hard. The truth is, every waking day of my life and your life that the Lord gives us the opportunity to proclaim His gospel is nothing but a mercy. Amen. It is a mercy. And I will never get over the mercy of this. What a mercy that I'm able to do this. I get up here every Sunday, have for going into the fifth decade here, is there a greater privilege than this? Is there a greater honor than this for an unworthy servant? Paul never got over that, never got over the glory of the gospel, and you'll see that come out as this passage unfolds. So rather than take more time here, I could say a lot more about that. Uh, that's what the pastor always says when he's just run out of material. Uh, he, brother, and we could go on and on, and you know he hasn't got a thought or a note, so. <laughs> All right, number three. How do I know that? <laughs> How do I know that? Number three, the glory of the gospel, the glory of the gospel showed up in His understanding of the superiority of the new covenant. It showed up in His understanding of ministry as a mercy, and thirdly, it showed up in His understanding of the necessity of a pure heart, necessity of a pure heart. While it is a mercy, that doesn't give room for sin. I love what he says in verse 2, we've renounced the things hidden because of shame. I don't have a secret life. I do not have a secret life. Don't you hate it when a, it turns out that a pastor has a secret life? That's horrible, isn't it? A hidden life of shame and all of a sudden it's a scandal and he's on 2020. I was in the newspaper. And how do you defend yourself when somebody accuses you of that? Because that's what they were doing. They were accusing him of having a secret life. In fact, you read between the lines of Second Corinthians, they were saying he was in the ministry for money, and I've been accused of that, and he was in the ministry for favors from women. And he says, I don't have a secret life. I don't, I've renounced that. His defense is in the first chapter, verse 12. He says, our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience. You get that? You can accuse me all you want. My conscience is not accusing me. That's where the battle is won and lost, right? James 1, sin conceives on the inside and finally shows up on the outside. Paul says, bring your accusations. The testimony of my conscience is that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. I can't say anything more to you who accuse me, and there were false teachers in Corinth just coming after Paul with a vicious campaign to destroy his credibility at this very time. That's why he writes the letter. And he says, my conscience is clear. When he gave testimony in Acts 23 and 24, he, he said it again twice, I have a clear conscience, I have a clear conscience. When you really believe in the glory of the gospel, you want to make sure your life is pure because you want to be a vessel unto honor, what's the next line? Fit for the Master's use. There's a fourth point here. When you understand the glory of the gospel, back to chapter 4, when you understand the glory of the gospel. You therefore are committed to preach the Scripture accurately, to preach the Scripture accurately. Go back to verse 17. You get a lesson there on why people do it. We're not like many peddling the Word of God, hmm, con men, hucksters, charlatans, frauds. There were lots of them in the marketplaces in the ancient world. Uh, they would um, dilute the wine with water. The soap was impure. The pottery they sold had cracks that was covered over by wax and would melt as soon as you put it on fire. They weren't sincere. They were kapalas, that's the word for peddling, kapalas, crooks, fakes, frauds. Here in chapter 4. Paul says he's not walking in craftiness, panurgia. Panurgia means, uh, orgia comes from energy to work. Pan means all who will do anything to deceive. Adulterating the Word of God means tampering, and it's particularly a word that's used with diluting wine. 
corrupting the manifestation of the truth. Look, if you believe in the glory of the gospel, you don't mess with it. You don't adulterate it. People who can get on television and twist and pervert the gospel to get money out of the pockets of sick people, old people, dying people, people looking for a miracle like a lottery winning ticket, don't understand the glory of the gospel. So he says, we don't adulterate the Word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Some people say, you know, uh, we, we have to kind of change the message because we're not getting results. You know, we've got to, got to deal with this message because it's not very effective, really. Well, the next point I want to give you is this. If you really understand the glory of the gospel, you know the results depend on God, okay? The results depend on God. Remember the parable of the sower? What does it say about the sower? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. doesn't say whether you should use left hand, right hand, throw high, low, curveball. Say anything about the sower? What does it say about the bag you carried the seed in? Nothing. Doesn't say anything about that. What does it say about the method he used to throw it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's a parable about soil. It doesn't even say anything about the seed, other than the seed is the truth, the gospel. It's not about your technique in throwing the seed, it's about the state of the soil. I don't do soil work. That's Holy Spirit work. I love that passage in Mark, a parable where Jesus says the farmer sows the seed and goes to sleep because he has no idea how it grows. That's right. Say, so we're not getting the results. Really? You think you're in charge of results? I hear there's some discussions. We have to overcome consumer resistance. Lots of luck. Consumer resistance is called depravity. Consumer resistance means the sinner is unable and unwilling, left to himself. Look at verse 3. This is so... this is so reasonable. This whole presentation of Paul makes so much sense, it just flows the way you think. Some of you are already saying, well, it gets discouraging, Paul, look, you're going from town to town to town, the churches are small, the churches are full of trouble, the town rejects you, the leaders reject you, the populace rejects you, they want to kill you, the Jews are after you, you're really not having much success. Here's his answer. Our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. That's a category of people. That's the default position of the entire human race. I'm not the problem. Well, how did they get like that? Verse 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. The problem is not your technique, the problem is the heart. So you have all these people coming up with pragmatic ways to do effective evangelism, really. To overcome consumer resistance, to make the message more palatable. We'll say more about that in some of the other portions of Scripture. You put yourself in the position of, uh, I wrote a book, Slave. Some of you seen the book, Slave? Imagine trying to sell that message in a world full of slaves. By the way, a crucified Jew in Jerusalem who was rejected by his people, rejected by his leaders, who was executed as a common criminal by the Romans, uh, rose from the dead. He's the true and living God, the only Savior, and He wants you to be His slave. Oh, really? <laughs> and by the way, you have to reject all other masters, confess your sin, repent, and turn to Him as the only source of salvation. Who is this again? A crucified Jew? This is what Paul is preaching in the Gentile world. And you need not only to put your faith in Him, but you need to confess Him as Lord and you're His slave. That's a hard sell. You can't overcome consumer resistance in a pagan Gentile world 
when you're talking about a crucified Jew to Gentiles who have no Old Testament background, who have no understanding of the sacrificial system, and you're asking them to believe that this crucified Jew is God incarnate, the only Savior, the only true and living God, the only hope of salvation, and you're supposed to become His slave, that won't fly, humanly speaking. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 1, as we will see later, the preaching of the cross was what? Foolishness. Foolishness. The results depend on God. That's been the joy of ministry. I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of sowing. I'm not in charge of growing. I can't give life. God alone gives life. And I love this. Watch this. Verse 5, we do not preach ourselves. Some, some method that we've concocted, some personal stories about us, but Christ Jesus as Lord. And we're calling everybody to become slaves for Jesus' sake. You say, well, how in the world do you expect to have any results at all with a message like that? Here's the answer, verse 6, oh, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Isn't that not the most profound verse? Oh, you know what he's saying? He's saying, uh, creation. God said, let there be light, and He spoke it into existence. That's the model for salvation. God steps into the darkness of the sinner's heart and turns on the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This is what makes ministry so thrilling. If you get all wrapped up in results, you're going to wind up preaching yourself and your technique and your style. And you're going to get caught up in your wardrobe and your shtick and your music and your cultural adaptations. Well, if you understand the glory of the gospel, you also understand your personal insignificance. So what have we been saying? If you understand the glory of the gospel, just to review, you understand the superiority of the new covenant, the mercy of ministry, the necessity of a pure heart, the fact that the Scripture is to be preached accurately, that spiritual results depend solely on God, and that you are personally insignificant, insignificant. I've gone back to this seventh verse so many times through the years. We have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure of the gospel in earthen vessels. Earthen vessel, clay pot. Clay pot. Okay, now stay with me on this one. Clay pot. What do you use a clay pot for at home? Put dirt in, stick a plant in it. In ancient times, a clay pot was... Breakable, ugly, disposable. Perhaps the best insight into what clay pots were used for was in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels. Oh, okay, gold and silver vessels. What do you do with those? You serve the food. Gold and silver plates and bowls. And there are also vessels of wood and earthenware. The gold and silver are for honor and the wood and earthenware are for dishonor. Are you ready for this? You serve the food on the gold and silver, you take out the garbage in the wood and earthenware, clay pots, garbage bucket, garbage bucket. Take out the family garbage. You know, that's what they said about Luther, he was a garbage bucket. So go back to this verse, we have this treasure in garbage buckets. 
That's a sense of personal humility, isn't it? Personal insignificance. Just a clay pot. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks this way in, in some very, for some people, some kind of troubling words uh, that seem to minimize the uh, sense of self-importance that some ministers have. Listen to what he says. Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 4, we are the scum of the world, the dregs of all things. Those words refer to the food that sticks to the bottom of the pot after it's cooled and hardened and has to be scraped off. Paul says, in a sense, we're just scum, we're just the last scrapings at the bottom of the pot, we're clay pots. You know, you have to be very important when you understand the glory of the gospel not to compete with the gospel yourself. Self-elevation is such a distasteful thing. Well, for the sake of time, just a few more. Paul embraced the, the benefits of suffering. So if, if you understand the glory of the gospel, this is another point, you understand the benefits of suffering, the benefits of suffering. You want to be more effective, you suffer more. James says, count it all joy when you fall into many trials because they have a perfecting work, right? You never understand ministry and effectiveness unless you suffer. And just briefly, verses 8 to 12, we already read that, afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted not forsaken, struck down not destroyed, caring about the body of the dying of Jesus and the, the dying of Jesus manifest in our body. Verse 11, the same thing, delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. Verse 12, death works in us but life in you. There's the key right there. Death works in us but life in you. The greater the sacrifice of your own life, the more you suffer, the stronger you become. Turn to chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians because you can't leave this out. Chapter 12, verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, Paul had these great revelations. You know, he had personal audiences with the ascended Christ on the Damascus Road and several other times as well. And he could have become very proud about it, so to keep him from exalting himself. And then he just talked about his trip to heaven, right? And he saw things that he couldn't even talk about. So uh, he could have used these things as a reason for his own pride. But to keep him from exalting himself, there was given me, he says, a thorn in the flesh. The word thorn is actually a spear, a lance literally rammed through his otherwise proud flesh. This lance is described as a messenger of Satan, an angelos of Satan. What is an angelos of Satan? A demon. Was this demon attacking Paul directly? Uh, the best uh, explanation of this is that this would be the demon leader of the false teachers who were blasting away at the church in Corinth, which he loved, and c consequently driving a stake through his own heart because of his love for that church. Here are false teachers led by demon power doing damage in the church in Corinth, and it's tormenting Him. And the Lord will let it happen to keep Him from exalting Himself. The Lord will give you enough trouble as a pastor to keep you from exalting yourself, even if He has to use demons to create the trouble. He said three times, I asked the Lord that it might leave me. He said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in what? in weakness. The more you exalt yourself, the more you force the Lord to humble you. If you understand the glory of the gospel, you understand the benefits of suffering. Suffering makes you more effective as an instrument because it grants you power perfected in weakness. Paul got the message, I'll boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. The more you exalt yourself, the more you become useless.
Just two thoughts to end. To understand the glory of the gospel is to understand all these things. I won't go over them again. And just two other things to consider. It's to understand the necessity of conviction. To understand the glory of the gospel, and this kind of sums up everything we've said, is to understand the necessity of conviction. Again, this is a passage that I go back to often. Verse 13, having the same spirit of faith according to what is written, and he's quoting out of Psalm 116, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak. <laughs> People have through the years said to me, well, you just, you just don't hold back, do you? No. One guy introduced me at a booksellers convention as John MacArthur who's much nicer in person than he is in his preaching. And uh, you know, there's a sense in which I understand that. I, I, I'm not trying to pick a fight with everybody. I'm just trying to proclaim the truth and I understand that the truth creates its own enemies. But this is, this is about the necessity of conviction. This is what integrity is. You can't preach something and then not care whether it gets enforced. You can't say, well, I believe this, but I'm not going to say it because people will be offended. If it's true, you have a mandate to proclaim it. Amen. I believed, so I spoke. Whatever you hear me say is what I believe. People say, why are you so passionate about everything? Because when I come to the conviction that this is what the Word of God means by what it says, I get excited about it because it's the truth. I believed, so I spoke. This is spiritual manhood. This is acting like a man. This is manliness. Speak with conviction. So what have we learned tonight? And we've just covered it briefly, but we have learned that if you understand like Paul did the glory of the new covenant. It has all kinds of implications in your life. You will never get over the superior glory of the new covenant. You will always understand the privilege of ministry as a mercy that you don't deserve. You will commit yourself to a pure heart because you don't want to do anything that would render you less useful in the proclamation of this glorious gospel. You will be responsible to accurately interpret the Scripture and never adulterate it. You do know that the results depend solely on God who gets the glory through the gospel. These are things that are so foundational. You see yourself as a clay pot, personally insignificant. You embrace the benefits of suffering which bring out divine strength and human weakness. You understand that this is a gospel worthy of conviction worthy of a life of integrity in which you believe it, and that's exactly the way you proclaim it. Mm -hmm.